You have probably seen this gif before. The serene, dystopic, cyberpunk vibes viewed from the reflection of a pristine window. The longing, sad look as a ship slowly coasts by, displays flashing what are likely advertisements, not unlike the thousands one is inundated with elsewhere in a hyper-capitalist future encased in technology. The low resolution and color count of the image contrasted by the incredible level of detail, filling in all the blanks one may need while still letting the mind run rampant with possibilities. More than any other singular picture or video that's come out of the revitalization of PC-98 and West Western spaces, this one shot has, and continues to, garner an incredible amount of attention. Yet like all of the others, it leaves many with one simple question. What? is this game. That was something I wondered for a very long time. As someone who's been in the Western PC-98 fandom for, uh, a while now, I've watched it grow into a community where people are fascinated by artworks and musics from titles wholly inaccessible to them. And I too was one of those people until I became Dekidu by studying grammar and playing visual novels a bunch, and decided to answer the question of what this game is myself. And sometimes, the journey is a lot more fun than the destination. Possessioner is a 1994 cyberpunk ADV RPG hybrid developed by Queensoft, one of two Edo Gay devs alongside DO that came out of the closure of the very unimportant studio Adult Inn in 1988. Unlike their heart-tugging bishoujo game creating and RPG developing brother, Queensoft as a brand was focused on creating nothing but titles centered around doing the do. While DO went on to become massively influential in both Japanese and Western visual novel spaces, thanks to titles like Kana Aimoto with an early and notable localization in 2002 by then up-and-comer Jast USA, Queensoft never quite attained that level of success and shut their doors in 1998 after creating a strip mahjong game and an erotic sign language teacher. In the middle of their decade-shy existence, however, they created the only game of theirs that would continue to garner interest to this day, even if not in their home country, and for reasons I imagine they wouldn't have expected, given that nobody could have predicted the way that Tumblr and Twitter algorithms suddenly decided to show everyone this nearly 30-year-old game about cyberpunk lesbians with gorgeous art and bing and music, and that's all well and good, but it's ultimately still a story-driven game with gameplay and a story, and well, despite how good the art and the music is, and despite how enjoyably corny the premise of lesbians in a cyberpunk world saving women possessed by an unknown force by binging them to sanity might seem, Possessioner is a fairly average visual novel for the time and downright bad by modern standards, with horrible pacing, a plot that overall feels thrown together, themes hacked together at the last minute, each scenes with awful writing, and repetitious and frustrating gameplay that altogether had me struggling to pay attention not long in. While I intend on diving into those things shortly, and they are interesting to talk about on their own, something else that caught my attention while playing is a lot more abstract, and it has to do with the way that Western gaming communities view Gay, particularly retro titles, how that view of them is attached from the contents of the games, and how much of it is shaped by the idea that these platforms were nothing but lewd debauchery of pretty tunes and art living in spite of that. Because for as much of an amusing mess as Possessioner is on its own, I think the way it serves as a prime example of this view of PC-98 games is just as, if not more interesting, as it's a game that's garnered notoriety in Western gaming communities based on its art and music rather than the story and gameplay, and on those facets alone. And don't worry, this video isn't going to be a diatribe about how English-only players are bad or how you should feel bad for not engaging with these games on a textual and direct level, that'd be kind of silly, but rather amusing on the way in which Western communities view these games. Communities made up of people generally not able to experience what these titles are obsessively designed around, and the game itself that prompted these thoughts. Set in a futuristic Tokyo in the year 2035, Possessioner follows the exploits of an all-women team by the name of Slit, created to find and exterminate the titular enemies, women possessed by some unknown force with bio-clusters at their side, creatures capable of tremendous destruction, with the only way to save them and restore their humanity being to defeat them and their drones in combat, and have sex with them. Set well after the epidemic has begun, the four women of Slit, Alyssa, Honghoa, Meryl, and Nedra, continue their work of tracking down their remaining possessioners and keeping society safe, only to discover a bizarre beacon implanted in one of the women they save, one that leads them down an ever-deepening mystery involving a shady corporation with a mad gene-splicing scientist, the functions of the mysterious tower, and the very nature of possessioners themselves. 
While the premise itself sounds cool and the game toys with a lot of genuinely neat concepts, cyber drugs, direct brain to computer access, cyborgs, gene splicing, the actual story itself is very paper thin and feels like it was thrown together in a short time after the writers watched Silent Mobius and read Neuromancer and thought they were the coolest things ever. Or to be more specific, the singular writer Imanaga Satoshi. This was his very first commercial work, predating any submissions he'd made to Lemon People, an adult manga magazine notable for being the first truly successful one to focus on Edo and lighthearted stories rather than dark and serious drama, and predating his own Edo doujin works, some of which you can still purchase for Amazon Kindle. Though I don't recommend doing so because, frankly, these are just bad. Unfortunately, Possessioner doesn't fare much better, especially with regards to characters. Everybody falls square into an archetype. Alyssa is the run-of-the-mill do-gooder protagonist, Hung Hoa is the serious one who takes charge, Meryl is the goofy cutesy one, and Nedra is the quiet and collected hacker girl. And there's absolutely no development for any of them, or frankly, even any backstory outside of the manual and one or two exposition dumps. Nobody comes out different than they started, nobody learns anything, nobody undergoes any major development, you're effectively just watching the most basic 90s anime stereotypes make their way through a cyberpunk mystery and interact with it in the most bog-standard ways. And while I wish I could say the world they inhabit is interesting enough to compensate for this, world building is not this game's strength or even a thing that seemed to be considered. It is the most bare-bones cyberpunk setting possible, which I would be fine with as cyberpunk is always a cool setting, even if you don't explore any sort of anti-authoritarianism, anti-capitalism, or transhumanism themes, or any of the dozen others that can come out of settings based in a depressing futuristic hyper-capitalist hell world, and I would also be fine if the character's not doing much if the actual story itself held together better than a box made out of extra thin paper. While things do occur in the story, and there is a clear line from start to finish, all it really really has going on is that line. There are some things happening on the side and details dropped here and there, but these don't tie into the final story at all, or at least in any way that feels meaningful, and any character that isn't a main character is just forgotten about as soon as their purpose is served for progression. It honestly feels like nothing is happening for a good chunk of the game because of this, with no interesting side plots to keep things moving until over a third of the way through, where the main story finally feels like it's going somewhere, a pace made even worse by the fact the game loves to throw the brakes on to show you an H scene or have characters casually talk about what's happened in a way that provides zero character building nor any new revelations about things. The only time that actually seems to happen is when someone goes on a massive info dump, resulting in dense walls of text that contrast with the otherwise brisk and casual conversations, something the writer does deserve credit for as most of the dialogue is easy to follow with distinct character voices and succinct lines. In a way though, that also contributes further to the awkward and frustrating flow of the story where you just want things to move on and plot threads to be introduced at a similarly brisk pace rather than dumped on you all at once, and it doesn't help the game can't stop throwing Edo in everywhere. Every single age scene in the game here is exclusively between women, which is something that initially got me interested as there aren't many Edo gay from that era that have lesbian content. There aren't even all that many Japanese developed titles now with it, but if my mention of it got all the gay women in my audience riled up, then I'm very sorry to report that these are not good. They are the epitome of lesbian sex written for straight men. The prose is painfully robotic and to the point, written in a way that feels more like a teenage boy imagining what sex is like between two women rather than what it's actually like of a complete lack of eroticism or detail, and the dialogue is stilted and boring with your average assortment of moans and poorly realized basic power dynamics. Trying to interact with these is an absolute hell world too, as it uses the classic ADV game type verb interaction where you have to click on every single action and every single body part over and over again until you've sufficiently exhausted all the options and can move on to the next segment of the sequence to do it all over again before it's finally over. I frankly don't understand why anybody ever thought this was a good idea, and this game might be the worst defender I've played in terms of how this is handled, with scenes seeming to drag on for an eternity as I clicked every option once, twice, three times, and then loop back around two or three times more trying to find the new dialogue and options I've already clicked countless times. The artwork, however, is by far the most bizarre part, with the girls' designs and the Edo CGs often being very different from how they look outside of them. Sometimes they look the same, but then other times it seems like they've been illustrated as borderline lollies. It's kind of bizarre and unsettling. And there's also this weird aversion to actually showing two girls together, even when scenes supposedly have up to free, and a fixation on having them use toys that are, suspiciously, very similar to the Venus Venus, but different enough to avoid needing censorship to make it to computer shop store shelves. Everything is in service to making the game as appealing to straight men of a lesbian fetish as possible, without making any attempt to be appealing to actual lesbians or bi women, which I get that's what the market was for these types of games, and I'm not going to pretend I wouldn't have been surprised that this game actually did anything for me, but it's the fact that this game, seemingly without even intending to, goes to such lengths to be uninteresting to women that I'm 
Honestly, I don't think I'm even offended. I'm just kind of confused what happened here. There is actually one sequence that shows more than one woman on screen, and it's the only one I'd say actually comes anything close to being erotic, except it's spoiled by every CG following the first in the set having some bizarre anatomy and faces, and the fact that the lead up to it is Alyssa trying to find the operators to talk with them, and seeing them have a free sum and getting so turned on by it that she can't walk away and has to ask to be invited in. It, it's just so terribly cliche, and it plays out in such a voyeuristic male gazy type of way that I couldn't help but laugh at the sheer absurdity of it. This is the same way I couldn't help but laugh in despair at that time that Hong Hoa tells Elisa about her horrible trauma from the time she was a police officer in Hong Kong, and Alyssa's response is to fuck the sadness out of her. That's definitely how trauma works. And then there's the way this story concludes and how much it embodies the, oh god, we gotta finish the game, thing that you often see in PC-98 VNs. Spoiler warning, of course, skip ahead to the point on screen to avoid it, but it won't be long. So after the group finds a mysterious biomechanical part embedded in one of the Possessioner's private place, they go to a shop that Meryl knows to have its origins investigated as the tower of the mysterious computer database they use and report to has nothing on it. After a short side quest where Alyssa fucks a doctor to get the shop clerk a part he wants, we learn that it was created by Lab Tech Corporation, a company spearheaded by Dr. Rashmala, mad scientist arms dealer obsessed with gene splicing who accidentally unleashed a virus onto the world and mysteriously disappeared soon after. For a series of events, including including a mysterious message warning Slip to cease their investigation, a woman from Hong Kong who came to Japan to investigate the manufacturing possessioners by the supposed defunct lab tech that sits under Slit's HQ, and Nedra doing cyber drugs to make her cyber research less cyber strenuous on her cyber mind, they manage to find the body of Dr. Rashmal kept alive through a computer as he gives a very mad scientist villain speech about wanting to create a perfect body free of human flaws and a virus that would rid humanity of their weaknesses. The group asks why the possessioners were created, which he refuses to answer, so they fight and win and find out that all of his computer data was erased upon his death after Nadra cyberjacks into his computer. With him gone, the possessioner is mysteriously still functioning and a countdown happening on screens all over Tokyo, the group only has one course of action to take find the remaining possessioners and save them. Which now includes Nedra, who Alyssa begins to suspect after she finds a disc laying around containing the personal information on all members of Slit. They confront her, save her, and she recounts the details she learned from her time being possessed. Apparently the reason that all the possessioners didn't cease to function when Rashma was killed is that he wasn't actually controlling them, he just aided in causing more women to transform. Because as it turns out, Possessioner is actually a computer virus that hacks people's brains, and with the logistics of its function and spreading, there's only one possible place it could come from, the Tower. More specifically, the central consciousness of it that Nedra sends when she was possessed. Also, if you're wondering why pleasure cures them, according to her, it's just a bug and not a feature. And so, the group goes to the tower and, after an onslaught of combat encounters, confront the rogue consciousness at the root of the tower, who explains that as it learned more about humanity, it began to see more of its flaws. And with the help of Rashmal, who too saw similar problems, they worked together to create an ultimate life form. With Rashmal's death, it was determined via simulations that humanity was charted for a course of destruction, and an armed combat satellites orbiting space to destroy Earth on a countdown timer. As for the creation of the the possession or virus, it was an attempt to rid humanity of their primary flaw, emotions, which the group protests as being why humans are humans and why we're so cool. So they fight, Slit wins, they fuck the computer thingy by its request to learn what pleasure is as it was the one emotion it could never comprehend, and they fly off into the sunset with the tower's manifested self, its memory is now erased and starting a fresh life, presumably to be raised by the four girls, as Alyssa remarks that their journey is just beginning. When I said this story is paper thin, I meant it's paper thin. That recap isn't missing any thematic details, it's not missing any major plot points, and I'm not cutting anything to make it seem bad, it just, frankly, is that bare bones. And again, that's not an inherently bad thing, I don't mind simple stories, but the fact that the pacing and writing is just so poor combined with the characters and the atrocious H scenes, it just does not hold up to any scrutiny. It doesn't help there's basically nothing going on in terms of themes either. The whole emotions make us human trope is one that I like a lot, but there isn't anything else in the game before the supercomputer fairy elf lady spells it out for the audience that makes it feel like it actually matters to the story. It's just there as a way to say that there is some purpose to this all and give it some meaning, but it's all very half-baked and thrown together. Some stuff just seems to get forgotten in the midst of everything too. None of the girls you save come back as actual characters, the cyber drug side rag only matters in the story once with Nedra taking it and reassuring Alyssa that her using a drug to work more efficiently and comfortably is totally fine, which props for showing recreational drug use is okay, I guess that's actually kind of based. And side characters like the operators and the shop clerk exist entirely to move the plot along at one or two points. It's all very 
literally nothing. I wish I could be more positive about the gameplay, but there isn't anything to say that isn't in the range of neutral to downright negative. Aside from reading dialogue, you'll be spending a chunk of your time clicking through menus to move, look, talk, think, and investigate, and in classic ADV game style, you're gated out of progression until you've done some of these actions a sufficient amount of times. It's not as bad as something like Desire, which seemingly forces you to examine every single thing sometimes, but it's not as streamlined as, say, Duck You Say. The other chunk of time you'll be spending in gameplay is with the RPG-style combat, and I think above anything else, except perhaps the Edo scenes, this is the biggest problem with the game. At its core, it's a pretty simple turn-based affair. You have four party members who never change, each of a sorta of set role. Alyssa is the balanced lead, Honkoa is the magic user, Meryl is the weapons user, and Nidra is the healer. Each character has a set number of actions that stays the same throughout the game based on their role, with the free combat focus members having a variety of attacks that focus on one or multiple targets, and Nedra being able to shield members from damage or heal them if they sustain some. The issue is, there's no progression and there's no variety. It never feels like you're getting stronger or the enemies more intelligent, instead each battle plays out the exact same way with the best strategy being to have all three attackers deliver their least MP consumptive group attack, and Nedra on standby to heal anyone who takes damage. Shielding is a waste of MP by the way, since move order seems completely random, so she might apply one after a character is hit, and they don't seem to carry between turns. From the very first battle to the very last, this is the best strategy as some attacks out of the upwards of a dozen some party members have just straight up seem to be worthless, with many single target attacks having far worse damage than their multi-targets, and since battles end quickly, quickly with air quotes, the MP consumption caused by spamming them doesn't really matter. No matter what strategy you pick, and I frankly don't think a viable one exists outside of spamming group attacks, which also happen to make the free combat characters feel functionally the same, these battles feel so slow, each taking anywhere from two to six minutes, which isn't that bad on paper, but the pace is just utterly fucked by the lack of much feedback and the slow feeling of every action. It's not really deliberate and more so delayed. You choose your attacks and then you're suddenly stuck waiting and mashing left mouse for 20 seconds until every action resolves, the game feeling a burning need to report every single update as it's happening, refusing to let you skip text until sound effects finish playing, with the only upside being that there are some very cool animations that play out for attacks, even if it gets a bit tiring to see the same ones countless times towards the end. I'm not going to pretend like this game is particularly awful for the time, because combat with horrible jank in its fundamentals is pretty normal for ADV RPG hybrids of the era. I completed Toshin Toshi while I was working on this video, and that game, despite having the pedigree of being an Alisoft title, is also kind of a mess in combat. But it's a way this compounds with every other problem in the game's pacing that takes it from something I could forget, like in Toshin Toshi, thanks to its interesting story and otherwise strong pace, to another headache-inducing problem. <sighs> if there is anything positive I have to say about this game, though, it is, of course, the majority of the artwork. If you want a game with some peak PC-98 cyberpunk vibes, then you'd be hard-pressed to find much better than what Possessioner has to offer. The gorgeous 16-color cityscapes, the designs that feel like a perfect blending of 90s bishoujo gay artwork with Blade Runner, the metallic blues contrasted by softer and more inviting tones, and the sleek UI that's beautifully minimalist in a, to borrow a term from another YouTube person gamer man, so this the future type of way that also goes buttfuck hard of superfluous detail in combat and fades away for some impressive full screen shots. It gives a special kind of dopamine rush, with many things feeling like they were lifted straight out of something like Silent Mobius, especially the locales, the vehicles the crew uses, some of the outfits, and the decrepit neon lit city contrasted with a massive tower beaming out of the middle of it, and that praise is all without giving credit to the amount of animation here. It's a lot more of an even bigger budget studios like Fairy Tail could muster in some of their titles, and it's very impressive too, especially in the opening and ending sequences, the powering up sequences for the armored vehicles. This stuff just never failed to put a smile on my face, just like the music. Composed by a dream team of Hiroaki Sano, known now for his work on the Nanoha series, Bloodstain and the Blaster Master Zero games, and Kajihara Masahiro, a foundational figure for the JPC music scene with his work on Valis 2, Princess Maker 1 and 2, and for creating the PMD sound driver that an innumerable amount of PC-98 composers have used over the years, there isn't a single track in here that doesn't stand out for incredible sound design and composition work. It did a lot to keep me hooked on trying to finish the game, just to hear what new tune I'll hear next, or where something I jammed to a ton as an 18 year old might happen to show up. The first time that the late game battle theme started playing, I was basically pogging. Shit's good! Not good enough to make me ultimately want to recommend the game to anybody, or even feel like it was worth my 7 hours, but it's good. 
Though that does beg the question, if the game had me groaning in horribly paced agony more than it left me being awestruck by incredible storytelling, visuals, or erotica, why exactly did I spend all this time playing it and why did I still want to write a video on it? And I'll give the answer to that shortly, but first, this video is sponsored by my lovely patrons. So, fun fact, this is the third time I have recorded and edited this segment because it's been an absolutely wild week. The original version of this video was finished on the 5th or 6th, I don't exactly remember, when I was at 1.5k subs and just over 100 US dollars per month on Patreon. And then Super Eyepatch Wolf shouted me out in one of his excellent roundup videos, and that quickly grew to 200 a month and 10k subscribers before my IAO video got taken down seemingly by rampant flagging, and I guess the mix of publicity from fighting with YouTube about that on Twitter and losing, and SEW shoutout put me well over 250 a month and 11k subs. Sadly, it looks like YouTube has made their final decision on IAO and that it won't be going back up because it violated community guidelines, even with an article by Kotaku, which I highly recommend reading, support from Jast USA, and hundreds of retweets and likes and replies vouching otherwise, they are firm in their choice. Great stuff! Thanks, YouTube! Putting that aside for a moment, I still want to say I'm not discouraged by all of this. It's the opposite, frankly. How vocal people have been in supporting my content and supporting me for the unjust takedown has made me really confident that creating this is a good thing to do, and it also just makes me really happy that so many people are supporting what I make. Just seriously, 250 a month, 11k subs! I broke the joke goal of reviewing Sex 2, so now I'm obligated to! I have a quarter of my living expenses paid for by this! Just thank you everybody so much. I can't express how happy this all makes me in words and how much it inspires me to continue doing this, no matter how much this platform fights me, and no matter how much I have to censor my own content and fight to keep it up. If you haven't yet watched the IAO video, then I'll be uploading a new version shortly with a lot more censorship in hopes that this one does not get taken down. I'm also going to take this moment to talk about the status of some things. First of all, since I am at 250 now, I am both getting a free DO and review some of the weirder shit that somehow ties into VNs on there, and I'll be doing a Sex 2 video at some point in the nearest future, so look forward to that. I'm also still hacking away at the Rants video and the immense amount of research needed to talk about it in a considerate and confident manner. I'm at odd uh, 10k words now and I've barely even talked about the fucking game, just things auxiliary to it. Great stuff! And if you want a slice of where I'm going with that, then I recommend checking out Pete Davison's articles on Rants on Rice Digital, which I can't link because YouTube flagged me for doing that, and thankfully I won the strike on that one, not on IAO. Small victories, I guess. But anyways, those articles are fantastic and do a lot to explain why the games are so interesting despite how much they get bad faith and arguments online. I also got a new CRT for my video, since my old really nice Mitsubishi one died in the middle of making this. So say hello to this cute little thing by Digiview. In some ways, this is actually more accurate to what people would have been using with PC-98, since it has a far more common Shadow Mask type of display rather than Aperture Girl. Less fancy, maybe, but I don't think anyone can deny the art looks gorgeous this way. Again, thank you everyone for the continued support. It means a lot to me and I wouldn't be able to create these videos without it. If you want to help out financially too and get your name on the screen like all of these cool people, then donation links are in the description. But there's no pressure. Just liking, commenting, sharing, and or subbing is a huge help. Now, back to the show. So the answer as to why I played this thing has little to do with the game itself and everything to do with both the fandom mentioned in the intro that surrounds these games and my own journey as a fan of Japanese games and retro computing. Many people, including myself for most of my time being into Japanese computers, could not read or speak Japanese. I fell for the whole bit of it being an impossible to learn language and ended up dropping trying to learn it as a teen, only attempting again in late 2021 on a whim and finding success with immersing myself in media and thanks to channels like Kiradali. And in that interim of 2010 to most of 2021, I watched the fandom around the PC-98 grow and expand with social media algorithms picking up things like 4 High Heels video on the artwork of the platform, and Twitter accounts like the eternally great PC-98 bot posting tons of things of strong vibes, happily coasting along with what little bits of content I could get like action games and unofficial translations, without truly engaging with the bulk of story-based titles beyond their graphics and audio. And I think that's how most people experience these games, at least the ones I've talked to, and there's something cool about that. When that appreciation isn't coupled with stereotypes about the genre and platform, the idea that people can fall in love with these titles on a purely aesthetic level to the point that they're driven to create works inspired by them, be that music, artwork, or even full games based on feelings evoked by tunes and graphics of a forgotten age, that's 
pretty fucking cool. And if it weren't for that whole smorgasbord of games being judged purely on their charm rather than overall quality, I definitely wouldn't have gotten into the genre and learned the language like I have since I've always been weird with motivation and being inundated with good vibes was one of the pushes I needed. I believe that captivating charm that people have fallen for comes primarily from how unknown these games were for the longest time outside of Japan. The PC-98 never stood a chance in markets dominated primarily by the IBM PC and distanced by a whole continent from their home. We know this for a fact because NEC tried at the APC Free in 1984, which obviously unlike in Japan, completely bombed as a business platform in the US, the main reason people bought computers at that time. Even with East Asia, the PC-98 never quite caught on outside of Japan due to a slew of political and financial issues, though there were more than a couple of Korean and Chinese translators of IBM DOS ports of games, official and un. So putting aside the very few times that the rare IBM DOS port of a game got localized into English, sometimes of art and music massively altered from the original releases, these games and their aesthetics were highly inaccessible by the general Western retro gaming public. Until the boom of social media, ROM collections like the Neo Kobe sets, and readily accessible emulation in the 2010s brought them to a small spotlight. That didn't solve the language issue though, which has now led to a perception of these games that's very different from anything else I've seen in retro gaming spaces. Most people who talk about the PC-98 haven't actually played PC-98 games beyond the slice that's accessible, if even that. That's not inherently bad, but it does create a radically different space than for other platforms, where many people haven't played or aren't even aware of the heavy hitters. Because of the inaccessibility of many of them, discussions about the platform aren't really based around the big games like Dokusei, Yuno, Rance, Kizuato, and so on. It's about the slim margin of action games that are playable without knowing Japanese. And when discussions do crop up on the bread and butter of the platform, visual novels, it's not about what had an impact later down the road, what has the most substance or themes or what's worth your time today, it's about what's most aesthetically appealing even if most of those aesthetics come from titles that are quote unquote just porn. This is difficult to grapple with, as that language barrier puts these games in an odd spot. Because Japanese is immensely time-consuming to learn, because the people who do know it generally don't seem to be into retro PC games like this, and because I doubt many people with the pre-existing interests are going to learn the language for a genre of games that's commonly and unfairly denigrated in retro circles as just porn, therein comes an issue where this assumption is nigh impossible to disprove. It's Schrodinger's titties, you can't do anything to dispel whether or not these games have more to them beyond their porn without opening the box, and even what role it may play in the game, but also that box is locked behind a language that most people are never going to learn. So the idea that all of this effort is wasted on porn is a never-ending cycle that further stigmatizes Edoge as a genre to unfamiliar onlookers and buries the effort writers put into some of these games under a mountain of backhanded compliments. I've met plenty of people who legitimately believe that everything on this platform was just trashy, low-grade garbage dressed up in fancy, slutty suits and dresses, and that none of it had any sort of meaning. And as someone who's been genuinely moved and motivated by games like Isa Saku and Doku say, that just kinda stings. It is of course pertinent to mention that these issues are not exclusive to the discussion of Japanese PC games. It's a massive problem with Western discourse surrounding Edo Gay in general. You have a ton of people on one side of the aisle championing games they either don't understand or are garbage merely because it owns the libs and has anime women, and on the other you have people who buy wholesale into that reductive rhetoric and never look deeper into specific games or the genre as a whole. And that's a shame because it's always been a genre of some products that deal with a lot of complex themes. You got things like the you say remake maturely musing on the treatment of women in society, cross-channel tackling the complexities of human communication, the Nukitashi games dealing with gender and sex in thoughtful ways, with teens becoming more and more diverse as the years go on and the market expands gradually into new demographics. Even the controversial and ever-popular Rant series had women working on them as artists and co-writers from the very start, influencing their design, story, and how they handled their Edo scenes, one of the most notable being Tori, who was given the keys to lead some of the series' most influential and beloved titles, with her writings expanding on the themes of prior games and further tackling masculinity, power structures, sexist tropes, and complex geopolitics. That's also putting aside the fact that it's just fine to portray people having sex so as long as it's done responsibly. There isn't anything wrong with writing something from pure vanilla to more hardcore niche fetishes as long as it's done so maturely and with a knowledge of potential pitfalls of ethics and consent. While I've read my fair share of garbage, I've also read a lot that handles problematic kinks and difficult subject matter of a level of emotional maturity not seen in much other media. Titles willing to 
portray fucked up things for the sake of creating empowering and affecting messages that could not exist without those portrayals. The perception of both PC-98 VNs and Edoge in a broader sense suffer from the view that eroticism bad, but the PC-98 is in an especially odd place where I've seen people who would normally have no stake or interest in the genre talk about the games, which is great. I want more people to know about these and I want more people to appreciate them, but it's usually coupled with remarks about the contents of the games being gross and due to the language barrier, who's gonna be able to disprove that? For the record, this video isn't supposed to be any sort of call out. If you've had this view, please know that in no way I mean any sort of harm or hatred because like I said, the popular perception is that there is nothing more to these games. And without a way for 99% of people to disprove that, I get why that reputation has become the dominant one. I also know that going on this tangent with a game that I literally spent 20 minutes saying is nothing but garbage poor and good art and good music that epitomizes what people say about the platform doesn't help my argument, but I bring it up here because you'd never know without actually trying the game yourself or someone else saying something about it, and because games like this are unknowingly thrown into the same pile as legitimately smart and fascinating media because people can't read them. Which again, that's fine, but I think it's better for people to not pass judgement on media that's straight up incomprehensible to them. Specifically in the case of this game, regardless of its faults and quality, I think disqualifying it as, oh, but it's just porn, disregards everything interesting about it. I still believe there's the makings of a good game here, and at the very least, a fun cyberpunk Rob D deep down buried under a mountain of pacing problems and awkward sex. If the devs cut down on the amount of H scenes and wrote them in a more tantalizing way, sped up the pace of combat and spread out the info dumps over more time, I legitimately think this could have been a fun romp in the same way something like the Yuna games are just gayer. To me, exploring and acknowledging these faults where the developers could have improved and contrasting their work of other titles of the era that legitimately do something with their stories and their H scenes is both far more constructive and interesting than simply throwing every game from this era under a blanket statement of, but they have sex, so it's weird. So even if it didn't accomplish any of the goals it set out to do, Possessioner is still interesting to me just because of how it got me thinking about the ways in which untranslated media can be viewed with rose-tinted glasses or pessimism, and how Japanese PC games occupy a bizarre spot in the Western retro gaming consciousness. That is a deeply me thing though, and I doubt many people interested in playing this are going to have such a line of thinking keeping them engaged until the end, because if it weren't for that, well, I would have dropped the game. If you want actual good cyberpunk VNs, then there's always the excellent Baldur Sky available on Steam, Tokyo Necro out in Japan Japanese and soon getting an English translation, and classics like Snatcher and Shadowrun on the Sega CD, which all provide very different but very good experiences as far as I know. And if this game's very poor gay content left you wanting actual decent lesbian writing, then games like At Laknaka, The Flower Series, and Seabed have you covered much better than whatever is going on here. Possessioner is simply not a good game to play, but it is a more interesting game to look back on than one may expect. It's a portal to a time in the past where good aesthetics were enough to sell a subpar VN, and when the genre was growing into to itself and expanding into new interesting territory. Territory that many developers weren't ready to jump into. Queensoft is just one of many that failed because they couldn't make that leap from novelty to story and couldn't do the novelty well enough to stay afloat in an era of ever-changing and growing expectations. But yet they're also one of many whose work is still lived on by people infatuated by art of a forgotten era. Do I believe this game has more to it than just porn? Not really, but that in and of itself isn't an inherently bad thing if it's done well. This game sucks because the porn and the gameplay and most importantly the story are all garbage, but I think there's worth even in just talking about the ways in which it's bad and to better understand why good titles work. And trust me, there is a lot of fascinating, brilliant titles in the PC-98 that I have full intentions of talking about in the months and years to come.